This is Andrew Stotts of A. Stotts Investment Research, looking at our value model, the way that I value companies. And in this case, it's going to be China High Speed Transmission Equipment Group, which is a Chinese company listed in Hong Kong. Now, first of all, this example was created on the 21st of February 2017. And what follows is not a valuation, forecast, rating, or recommendation. Rather, it's a teaching example. What follows is not investment advice. It is a teaching example. It is intended only as academic information to those who want to learn about valuation. It should not be construed as the basis for any valuation or investment. The information in this presentation came from various sources which we believe are reliable, though we do not guarantee the accuracy, adequacy, or completeness of such information. I hope you enjoy learning about valuation as much as I do. So let's look at the background of the company. China High Speed Transmission Group Company Limited has top market share of transmission gears used in wind power that are manufactured in China. CHST. China High Speed Transmission is the manufa biggest manufacturer in China by revenue of transmission gears for wind power equipment and has been has around half of the domestic market. It also has a quarter of the market overseas for the product, the main customer in the US being GE. China High Speed's revenue breakdown as of 2015, 80% wind power transmission gears. 14% industrial gears, marine gears, and others at 6%. Now, let's go through some forecast assumptions. First of all, the main assumption is revenue growth. The company is experiencing revenue growth of 5% in 2016, but has been as high as 25% in the past. So, in this case, uh, let me get my pen here. Hold on. In this case, we can see our revenue assumption right here, which is going down to 14%. And that's going to get somewhat equal EPS growth or net profit growth. And then here you can see the net margin has actually recovered quite substantially. And I'm going to say that that's going to maintain. Now, an, an analyst that may look deeper into this may decide, well, that's going to crash. It can't be that high. And some analysts may say that it could, be, it could go even higher. That's a separate issue. Now, let's look at the balance sheet. And what we're going to see here in the balance sheet is, first of all, what I like to look at is the amount of cash. And this company has been accumulating a lot of cash, and eventually that will probably go down. And what we can see is that the long term, uh, the, the net fixed asset growth is one I look at quite a lot. And that I'm going to estimate comes down as revenue starts to fall slightly. And what we can see is a measure that, that, that's an important measure, which is asset turnover, which has been improving and improving, and I expect will improve over time. So clearly the company's revenue growth will be higher than its assets growth in this forecast. Now let's look at the liability side of the balance sheet and the key item that we can see here is that a accounts payable will finance a lot of this company's current assets and even long-term assets. In fact you can see long-term debt is almost non-existent. Now where the rest of the financing will come over time will be through retained earnings. So as the company continues to make a high profit and retain most of that, uh, they will be able to finance that growth. And what we can see right here is that it's a 25% uh, dividend payout ratio that we're expecting. And that is why we can finance growth with retained earnings because that means 75% of earnings are going to be uh, kept in the business. So. What cash flow does that give us? Well, right here we can see the operating cash flow growing over time. We can also see another very important input. And really, to me, the most important inputs are what's happening with working capital and what's happening with CapEx. And we can see steady growth in the amount of investment. If it's a negative, it clearly means that the company does have more investment to, to do to get the growth that they want to have or that I'm forecasting. 
So now let's move into the valuation section. And the first thing I want to look at is the free cash flow that we can derive from all of those forecasts. And here we have it. First, we start with the earnings before interest in taxes, and we make an adjustment for the tax rate. Has been high in the past, but we're going to assume it's about 20%. And we get the net operating profit after tax, which is right here. And what you'll notice is I have the historic data, then I have my discrete period, and then I look at the first two periods of the fade. Now that fade period I set within the model at three or five or ten years, and this allows me to see the transition from discrete to fade. And what I'm looking at in particular is what's happening with the free cash flow of the firm. We can see it's rising here, rising, rising, but then it starts to fall slightly over time as we're fading down the, uh, the profitability of the company. So we can see here how is the structure of the liabilities. We have total debt and equity, and then there's cash, which we back out, and we can say that the amount of capital that's been invested in this company is about 13 uh, 13 billion uh, Chinese yuan and that's going to rise over time to as high as 18 then this will be tapered off and we'll see it's pretty slow growth at this point in the fade period and return on invested capital is the critical matter measure here and we can see that that's gone up to 12 that will be high over time so someone may say oh you're too aggressive don't be so aggressive in your return on invested capital assumptions here. That's fine. We can do scenarios on that or we can say let's reduce that. One thing that we can say is that the benefit of the fade period is it allows us to make an adjustment down on the return on invested capital. And what should return on invested capital be? Well, probably to the industry average or to the cost of capital, which we'll talk about that in a second. Now, let's take a look at earnings per share. We can see earnings per share growth has been darn high. It's still high, coming down, down, and kind of stabilizing. And then you can see during the fade period that growth is slowing down. And what we can also see is that there's no change in our assumption right now for dividend payout ratio during this period. So we're going to see that the dividend growth is going to be the same as the growth in EPS. Next is a very big slide, but the key thing that we're trying to do is determine these items right here. And what we can see from this is we have to make a decision about the risk-free rate and about the market premium. In this case, I'm going to use 3% for risk-free rate for Hong Kong and 7% for market premium, meaning that over the, the from now to infinity, the expectation is that the Hong Kong market will grow on average 10% each year. And what we can see is the company's beta in the past has been slightly higher risk than normal or than average. So I'm going to use a 1.25 beta, and that gives me about a 12% uh, cost of equity for the company. Now, we can look at the cost of debt and see that it was recently very high, but that'll probably come down, and here we can show that. And also the tax rate, I'm assuming, is about 20% for the future periods. And we can also see that debt has been a big component of the capital structure. I'm going to bring that down a little bit to 35. And so from that, we can see a weighted average cost of capital over time of 9.6 for the discrete period and 9.9 .9 for the fade and terminal period. Next, we have to make some assumptions about the, uh, the fade period. And here I'm going to use a, it's a five-year discrete period. I always use five years for forecasts. And then the fade period, in this case, I'll choose as a five-year fade period and a linear fall in the profitability. Uh, what we can see from this is the invested capital growth at the final fade year is going to be 5%. This is just a check to make sure that I'm not crazy in my assumptions. And also, the ROIC, return on invested capital at the final fade year, 
if it's faded to the weighted average cost of capital is the weighted average cost of capital of 9.9, which we saw. And that means that the fade, we're fading the ROIC to WAC, not to a premium or a discount to WAC. Now the growth in the terminal period, I'm assuming is about 3%. And also in the fade period, we've got a uh, dividend payout ratio of 25%. Now we probably could up that to 40 or even 50% as we usually can, can think that for the long term a company will pay out a high dividend. But for right now, let's keep it there. Now what we can see is that what are the implied multiples that come out of the assumptions related to the weighted average cost of capital and the growth assumptions and the cost of equity and the growth assumptions here for the dividend discount model. Now it tends to be that a high multiple here will increase the value of the terminal value. So we want to be careful if this is a 20 times multiple, it's probably too high, something's wrong. And if this is a, a very, very low multiple, uh, then something's also wrong too. I would say this is slightly high, but not that high. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that one too much. And we can get a picture of NOPAT um, right here. And in fact, a better way to look at NOPAT is this. We can see that um, we've got a actual period, which is yellow, and we can see that NOPAT has been rising. And our discrete period is going to show a steady rise, which I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out a cyclical movement. And even if I could get that right, then an average would, would represent that, right? And then after that, we move to a period of fade where we're fading down the net operating profit after tax. And you can see that by the growth in net operating profit after tax, which is negative, right? And then eventually we get to the terminal value. Now, if we look at the absolute value or the free cash value uh, for the firm free cash flow value, what I like to look at, so we're going to look at dividend and we're going to look at free cash flow to firm and free cash flow to equity. And what we can see from this is that 50% of the value is in the terminal value here, 40% here and 26% there. Now we can also see that when we look at free cash flow to the firm, we always add back cash that's on the balance sheet because this valuation section right here, this is related to operating, what I could call operating value, or as I call it, you know, the, it's really just free cash flows related to the operating assets of the business. Whereas this is just current value, which is just current cash. So we add back that current cash in both cases, and it can account for 30, 25 to 30% of the value of the company. Now, in the case of free cash flow to equity, we take away what we have to pay in debt. And that what remains is this 16201. And that 16201, remember that we've used a, a WAC to discount this, and we've used a cost of equity to discount this. And what we can see from this is a range of value, 5.6, 9.9, and 11.3 which shows that generally this is above, two of them are above. Dividend discount model tends to understate the value, at least in Asia these days. So I would say that the value here is possibly above the price, which would mean that the company may look attractive based upon these assumptions. Now remember, my assumption in the net profit margin and the growth in the future years, particularly in the discrete period, is very high. Remember at the beginning, I said that we may adjust down that net profit margin. Now, the next thing is just, just to review PE. PE is an easy to use, right? Easy to use and commonly used measure of company value. It can be described as what you would pay in price for one in earnings. A company is cheap or expensive compared against its direct peers, its industry average, its country average, and against itself over time. Now, what you can see is I'm looking at this company, which is in the capital goods sector right here. Capital goods sector, so I'm looking at Hong Kong, capital goods sector, Asia, capital goods sector, and world. So I'm trying to compare against an industry average, a country average, and also I'm showing itself over time, which we can see here. 
and now we look at the forward periods. Now we can go back a lot longer than that, but with Chinese companies, I think you get a very distorted picture if you go back too far because growth has been exceptionally high. And um, a low PE does not always mean a stock is cheap. Earnings could be exceptionally high and ready for a fall, or the future growth could be in peril. Now, this company definitely is cheap relative to the industry average, right? If we want to look at it that way. And using only EPS does not take into consideration future investments to maintain that earnings growth. And it also doesn't take into consideration kind of perceptions of management, uh, risk, uh, corporate governance, those types of things. But using the PE multiple of the telecom, or sorry, not of telecoms, but of the capital goods sector right here, then, uh, so that was a mistake, sorry about that in Hong Kong as a valuation basis gives us a value of about, let's say 13.4 for the company based upon PE. Now, if we look at price to book for capital goods sector, we can see that the company's price to book is actually a little bit higher than the Hong Kong average and just about in line with Asia, but it's much cheaper than the world. So one of the questions about when you look at the world is, just because the world is high in, in PE or price to book doesn't mean that a particular country stock will go to that point. Now, uh, what we can see is that the company's ROE is double, double what's being earned across Asia and is still at a premium to the world. So having a premium in price to book does probably make sense. It could potentially even go to more of a premium, but there must be other factors, right? So again, using the price to book uh, multiple multiple of the telecom or sorry not telecoms of the capital goods sector we can come up with a value of about 6.24 now relative valuation using multiples indicates a range a value that ranges between 6.24 and what we saw on the past page 13.4 the current price uh, of 8.1 is within that range so is the company super cheap well probably not super cheap is it super expensive no um, it doesn't appear to be. Last thing we'll look at is sensitivity analysis where I look at three variables, sales growth change, gross margin change, so profitability, discount rate change, and terminal growth rate change. Let's start with terminal growth. Terminal growth change does not have anything to do with the fundamentals of the business. It only has to do with our valuation. And what we can see is we've chosen a 3% terminal growth. If we were to increase that to a 4% terminal growth, we would see the dividend discount value would go up slightly from 5.6 to 6.1. And free cash flow to the firm would go up to 10.6. And free cash flow to equity would go up to 11.8. Now, we can also look at our discount rate of 11.8 and say that we raise that discount to 12.6 or bring it down to 10.6. And of course, a rising discount rate, right? We can see right here the values that it will cause on this side of the valuation. And then finally, we can look at things that will affect the fundamentals of the business. And in this case, if we saw that sales jumped by 10 percentage points, so right now we're at 14.6, imagine it was 24.6 what impact would that have on EPS growth? So EPS growth would go to 26.5. And we would see that the DDM value in particular, we can look at just that one, will go up a bit. That's about in line. Now we can see a little bit of difference here where this goes to 10.3 versus 10.6. So I would say it's not highly sensitive to these changes. So there you have it. And uh, that gives you some idea of the value of this company, China High Speed. And let me know if you have any questions or comments and things that you would like to learn or companies you'd like to see a valuation learning session on in the future. Take care.